I am Steve Bailey. I've been in the neighborhood since 1965. If you kind of look at the history of baseball stadiums in the Twin Cities, the original one, they built on the outskirts of town. The original one was downtown, in what they call Lower Town. And at that time, downtown was really centered right around where the capital is now. Um, and that would have been considered on the edge of town. The next stadiums that, and that would have been in the 1860s. In the 1870s, there was one built at Oxford. Um, and that lasted for, I think, five years. There were problems with the neighbors. And then the ours went in in 1897. Lexington Ballpark is bordered by University, Lexington, Fuller, which is no longer there, and Dunlap. And the original home plate was, and the entrance to the ballpark was at the corner of Dunlap and Fuller, which would be one block um, south of University. So you know, we want to call it a standard size baseball stadium, obviously, I should say not obviously, it was uncovered. Um, you had the bleachers, which would have coverings over part of them. Um, but baseball, back to what the Twins are doing right now, going with an uncovered stadium. It would be called the St. Paul Saints. The St. Paul Saints still plays baseball at the Midway Stadium um, on Energy Drive, right, on, right off of Thumb Snelling. At the time that the baseball was there, it was really the streetcars were the main system to get there. Um, by the time the 50s come about, the streetcars were on the way out. In 54 is the last streetcar. Now you had mainly your um, bus transportation and your cars. Um, now it became outmoded for a area to go to, and that's when the Metropolitan Stadium became an area of interest. The baseball stadium was built basically out of wood, and the original one, it burned in 19. 15, in 1914, in 1915, they rebuilt it and they reorientated home plate to be at the corner of Dunlap and University. There were many complaints of the people about having to walk too far because the streetcar led off at University in Lexington and they had to walk two blocks to the stadium. Now they had to walk one block. My name is Nancy Bailey and I was born in this neighborhood in 1948. I've lived in the neighborhood, grew up in the neighborhood until 1970. Then I moved to California, was out there 30 years, returned here in 2001 and I've been here ever since. Circus Hill, when it was there, there was no freeway so it extended beyond the streets there. And where this building is located, um, Sky and Tower, there was a railroad track spur that came and ended right at this building. And then they would unload all the wagons and truck them across the street. <laughs> a circus started way back in the 1800s. Um, and there were many different circuses. Many, there were like 100 different circuses in Wisconsin alone. So they would come to Minnesota and play. I knew it as a child, and as a child, it seemed like a big circus. I know many elephants. There were lions and tigers. There were dogs. There were aerial acts. Um, clowns. The ringmaster. So, and, and plenty of people behind the scenes. 
It was entertaining. It, the thing I did not like about the circus was that there were three things going on at once. There were three rings, and you had to choose which ring you watched. Because you, you could sort of see them all, but you'd miss half of what was going on in different ones. So every once in a while, they'd have a special, you know, it's called a three-ring circus. And that's where you get the three rings. And sometimes there were aerial acts going on at the same time. People who would go on walk tight ropes, people who would swing on trapezes. Um, everyone was, you know, an actor, so to speak. Um, some of the stunt would be the clowns, if you've ever seen all the clowns that come out of one car. <laughs> they have to be stunt people in order to fit them all in there. <laughs> doesn't differ too much. They still have the same type of acts. People work with horses, people work with dogs, they still have the clowns. They now have more safety measures in place for the trapeze artists and the people who walk tight ropes. Um, but otherwise, basically, it's the, they always have, you know, the lion tamers and it's basically the same. I like the clowns, and I like the trapeze. And every time I could go, they also had helium balloons. And they'd sell them. And so you could get, like, a balloon. And a lot of kids let their balloons go, and they'd all end up on the ceiling. <laughs> and, and in fact, I have, like, some of the old, old circus wagons that they used to have. Um, they don't use these anymore. Hi, my name is Bonnie, I'm 11 years old. I live with my dad, and my sister, and my brother. I just got a tongue. This is a new clothes for each. One, two, three, another one. I bought it to all my people. I live 24 floor. 24th floor is the highest floor. My favorite thing about the 24th floor is the lights. This is Mohammed and I'm 10 years old and I live here. Two years? Yes, two years. This is my little brother and he's singing ABCD for me. What's ABCD? ABCD This is the security place. You look for bad people. <laughs> this is the Skyline Tower and it's huge. 
And you can even see that sky too. Skyline Tower was built in 1971 and it was built as a skyrise apartment for seniors back in those years. It is actually the largest affordable housing community in this side of the Mississippi River. My name is Mohammed Khalif. Um, I moved here in February 2008. My name is Lisa. Um, I've lived here one year and I moved here from Stillwater, Minnesota. My name is Wa. I live here. I, I come back in America in 1995. I live here till 2000. Roger Allison. I lived in Skyline for 11 years. Actually, I moved here from off the street. People know about Skyline Tower because Skyline Tower is one of the main first stops when people come to the Twin Cities. So if they're working with um, a social worker or somebody in Ramsey County who says um, they need a place to stay or they need a place to live that's affordable, Skyline Tower would be the first place that a social worker would, um, would send someone to fill out an application. All our friends and families, they, they do kind of get together um, like occasionally on Saturday nights or Friday nights when everybody's off. Um, yes, we, we go out to Target, you know, um, we watch movies together. You know, uh, there's a lot of friendly people here. If you like to have fun and talk to people, like if you're bored, you can just come here and like make a friend or something. I met people in a building eight, 10, 11 years ago that I still visit with, that I still talk to. Uh, I have people that I'm still working with people on how they can get better with their math and with their language. And, and it, it's kind of funny because Hasi was a man that used to live here. He would listen to the news and then he called me up and asked me what that a certain word meant. Because he didn't know, he didn't understand what the word was. So he called me up and said, well, what does this mean? I said, well, I said, tell me what, how it was used in a sentence. So then he'd tell me what it was said on the news, and I'd say, oh, okay, and then I'd explain what he was trying to get across. And we still do that today. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's always easy to live for, for families to live in a building that goes straight up 24 stories. Tôi sống đây thích lắm mà nhưng mà vô cầu thang có khi Người ta đông quá rồi nó lấn tôi té luôn á, ngã vô mình người khác á, luôn á. Cái chân này mổ nữa nè. Mà cái chân này thì, cái gì này, mà lấn tôi tôi té luôn á. People move in and out, I mean, sometimes people, they move in and they don't follow the rules and they destroy what they built. Um, I think there's lots of people who move into Skyline who don't have a whole lot of money and so there's always challenges with, with making a household budget work um, when you've got kids to feed and kids to put clothes on them and uh, paying the rent and paying the telephone bill and um, there's lots and lots of financial pressures on families that live here. Um, what else? I think when you're coming from a different country, there's, there's tons of new things to learn and get mm -hmm. used to. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of people that are very racist because a person comes from another country. It takes a while for them to adjust to what this world is like. There are over 1,000, about 1,000 people here, and it's very 
crowded. There's a lot of stuff going on. There are a lot of social services for the for the uh, residents and the the neighbors. Common Bond has a, a model of providing affordable housing, but providing that affordable housing with services. And so the Advantage Center is the place where those services are provided to Skyline Tower residents. Mm -hmm. And so we've got the computer lab here. We've got the kids' uh, homework center and kid, the youth room right next door. Mm -hmm. Next door to that is the early childhood family education room. And then upstairs we've got, um, gosh, we've got a food shelf. We've got the career resource room. We've got uh, a classroom for uh, people, who, adults who are learning English. We've got a teen center next to that. We took over one of the classrooms upstairs that used to be used for teaching English for the teens because the teens really didn't have a place. Mm -hmm. um, We've got a health, a health community, a Somali community health worker up there. Not very many places to go where you can have affordable rents. Um, as many, most of the apartments at Skyline are where the resident pays 30% of their income. I was surprised they let me come in because they didn't have a job, I didn't have nothing. I think that's something that's, another thing that's special for me is that there's people that, adults that come that have never gotten a chance to go to school and didn't speak any English mm -hmm. when I met them a few years ago and now they're speaking English and they're reading and writing. We have over 300 children that live in the building. So there's about a thousand people total, like I had said, but over 300 of them are kids under the age of 18. I think that Skyline's going to turn out some of the first uh, Somali lawyers in this country. I think it, they're gonna, it's going to turn out some of the first Somali mm -hmm. people in politics. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes, I would like to continue living here because it's a really great, great place to live at and um, there's lots of people here I can talk to and like have fun. Hello, my name is Abby. I'm 11 years old and. Shut up! Okay, and I've lived here in Skyline for four, four and a half years. Today I'm learning and reading Naruto. And now the page is, is Naruto against Kiba. He's going to read Naruto for. And he does shadow call. This, this is Naruto. He is the. This is his girlfriend Hinata. And this is Neji's her, her cousin. And this is Hinata's cousin Neji. And Neji and Hinata. Fight! Turn the page. He yeah, almost oh, killed her. Day. He got blood from her. Yeah. He takes people chakra. Hi, my name is Abdi Majid. I lived at Skyline Tower for nine years. I am nine years old. Oh, hi, what is your name? My name is Christina Tots. How would you describe your work? Well, I coordinate the youth programs here at Skyline, which means that I work with 
anybody who's from kindergarten until sixth grade and usually after school time. So helping with homework, there's a couple programs like learning circles or campfire that come in. So I'm around and help out during those programs and I get to talk to teachers and parents and work with volunteers and do any of the paperwork or the things behind the scenes to help make sure that when all the kids get home, they can come down here and work on their homework. What are your responsibilities? I am responsible for getting the materials that we need for programs and sending out letters to teachers and interviewing volunteers and getting them set up and helping out and helping with homework and reading um, and just making sure that all the pieces are in place to have homework center. What are the kids' responsibilities? Well, kids are responsible for getting their own snack and doing their homework and reading with somebody every time they come down. Some of the older kids help and read with the younger kids or work on ABCs or something like that. Um, they're responsible for helping to make sure that everyone is able to get their homework done and learn from each other and picking up things after they're done. Are, are the, are, is, wow, is the, is, is this a place that is a good place to work? I love working here. I really like all of the kids who come through here and I enjoy getting to talk with their parents and I like that they live close by. Every day is a little bit different, and I like that. I'm living room, living room, living room. I'm pretty much gonna clean it. Kitchen. I'm in the bottle on the back, right? Hey, Shukri. You should have taken a video of me when I was sleeping. Bathroom. I did. My sister's room. My room. Yeah? Video project, I don't know. Could you go? And back to the room. Scouring rooms. Scouring towers. Outside. Let's keep on going. Hey, hey, you watched that movie yesterday? That when they were talking to the ghost? Ghost? I don't know. People wait elevators for. Stairs. Sometimes it comes early. So That's how the elevators look. Look, this one looks good. What about me? Where are you going, 24? Yeah, yeah, put the push ups, then she'll take a video of you. No, I'm not taking a picture of her. Yeah, the way. I'm not good taking a This is the elevator. It took so long, Mary, to come back to the computer lab. So. Here's a great view from our side. Snow 
was going. I sometimes drive, um, I have my son, and we're right on the bus line. I forget how to get on, uh, how to ride the buses. I gotta work it a couple times to be able to uh, know where I'm going. I, I, it took me a while to learn how to get downtown St. Paul. Took the 21 down there, take the 21 back. My name is uh, John Deers. I was born in St. Paul, grew up in the Twin Cities, and I spent most of my uh, career with the Metropolitan Transit Commission uh, in the transit business. I was also involved uh, with uh, the Minnesota Streetcar Museum and the preservation of uh, uh, streetcars in the Twin Cities. The planning and engineering for the light rail line is underway right now. It's in a phase called preliminary engineering. Construction will probably start sometime next year. And if all goes according to plan, the first light rail cars will appear on University Avenue in 2014. The light rail trains are faster because any electrically powered vehicle can operate with greater acceleration. In other words, it gets up and gets moving faster um, than a bus. So when you're on the light rail, you'll find that when you start from a standing um, a stop, you'll get up to speed a lot faster than you would on a bus. The other difference, of course, is the fact that the light rail trains will carry more people um, than, than the bus, and they'll get you where you want to go um, a, lot, uh, a lot faster. Well, there have been streetcars, there were streetcars in St. Paul and in Minneapolis starting in about 1873. Uh, they were called horse cars and were pulled by horses. The electric cars, electric streetcars came in in about, uh, in about 1890 or so and they lasted until 1953 when they were replaced by buses. Uh, people took the streetcars, traveled everywhere. They took them to work, they took them to school, they took them on, on shopping trips, and they even took them downtown to get on the train to travel out, out of the city. They were designed to accommodate about 50 or 60 seated passengers, but they could carry with standing passengers as many as 120 or 125. And they ran full most of the time, especially in the first part of the 19th, or rather the 20th century, because there were no automobiles around at that time. The streetcar was the only way to get around the city. This is a photo from the 1920s. It's not dated, but it shows University Avenue and Snelling Avenue. And this was part of the huge Twin Cities uh, Railway Company's streetcar barns. So this is where they actually built streetcar vehicles, where they repaired them where they went at night when the line wasn't working, not too far away from where Skyline is today. The streetcar was powered by electricity and the power really didn't change over the years. Uh, what did change, of course, happened when uh, the buses came in in 1953. And then from electric power, uh, electrically powered vehicle, we went to a diesel powered vehicle. And that's very much as we are today. This is the model of the streetcars. Um, they use they use the blueprint to build the old streetcars, and the the streetcars used to run on University Avenue. You could go anywhere on University Avenue by uh, by by streetcar in the 1940s and 1950s. It was the main corridor between Minneapolis and St. Paul. It was the way to get between the two cities. It was the busiest streetcar line in Minneapolis and St. Paul. The cars. Um, ran as frequently as one minute apart. In other words, you could be standing on a streetcar, look down University Avenue and see an endless row of streetcars carrying people between, between the two cities. Uh, young people, kids, took the streetcar, the same as adults. Um, in fact, many, many kids from that era rode the streetcar to school, took it to school. 
As ridership declined and as people drifted away to automobiles and freeways, the revenues went down. And of course, streetcars were very expensive. And the company, which again was, was privately owned, uh, couldn't recover enough revenue to keep the cars in operation. So the decision was made uh, in the early 1950s to gradually convert to buses. If you go out today and go to the middle of University Avenue and chop a hole in the asphalt, you'll find the streetcar tracks because they're still there. Otherwise, the streetcars themselves, some were sold to other cities, to other transit systems. Others were um, burned. They were just simply scrapped. They were huge, huge vehicles, at least from my perspective when I was four or five years old. That and they were very roomy and airy. The windows opened wide on the car, so even on a hot summer day you got a good breeze um, going through. And they had their own peculiar mm, feelings or sights and sound. It was a different experience than a bus, and for that reason, as, as a small uh, child growing up at the time in the early 50s, I really missed them and I wish they'd come back. Well, here I am at age 65, a long time later, and the light rail is making a comeback, and presumably I'll be around in 2014 to ride them on University Avenue, just like I did when I was four or five years old back in the 1940s. Hi, my name is Brad. I am 10 years old. I live in Scotland. My name is Shavian. I'm 41 years old. My good man is my hair. Blah, blah, blah. My name is Jonas. I'm 10 years old. I lived here for five years. Done. Let's turn it off. I interviewed my dad. Do you remember what you thought when you first saw me? Yes. Cute. <laughs> How did you choose my name? Your mom did. It. What was I like as a baby? Beautiful. What were it, the hardest moments you had when I was growing up? Uh, when I lost my job. Uh, what are your dreams for me? Uh, all that stuff. Bro. I want to be the, the best and uh, person you can be. The Thank best. you. Oh, keep going. My dream for you, just to be the best person you can be. Thank you for the end of you. Done.